A reading from Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. Additionally, then, brothers and sisters, we ask and encourage you in the Lord Jesus that as you have received instruction from us on how you should live and please God, as you are doing, do this even more, for you know what commands we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is God's will, your sanctification, that you keep away from sexual immorality, that each of you knows how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not with lustful passions, like the Gentiles who don't know God. This means one must not transgress against and take advantage of a brother or sister in this manner, because the Lord is an avenger of all these offenses, as we also previously told and warned you. For God has not called us to impurity, but to live in holiness. Consequently, anyone who rejects this does not reject man, but God who gives you his Holy Spirit. The word of the Lord. Please be seated. Good morning. Good to see you. If I haven't met you, my name is Father Aaron Damiani, and would like to invite you to turn to 1 Thessalonians. We're we're in a series called Saints Like Stars, the beauty of Christian distinction. And one of the images for this series is the image of stars, which you can't see in the city, can you? You can't see stars in the city. It's really sad. They're there, but they're washed out by the light pollution. The city also misses the beautiful distinction of saints. They're there, but you can't see them lost in the haze. And it wasn't always this way. Actually, in the urban centers of the ancient world, including the one that um, Paul writes to that we're going to look at today, Christians stuck out not because that they were weird or because they were fighting with the culture, but because their lives radiated hope. And that's why they stuck out. One historian from the second century named Methates observed this in a letter that he wrote to one of his friends. And here's what he said. For the Christians are distinguished from other men, neither by country nor language nor the customs which they observe, For these Christians neither inhabit cities of their own, nor employ a particular form of speech, nor lead a life which is marked out by any singularity. Translation, they're not just being strange for strange sake. They're not just being weird. He continues, they follow the customs of the natives in respect to food, clothing, and the rest of their ordinary conduct. They display to us their wonderful and confessedly striking method of life. They marry, as do all the others. They beget children, but they do not destroy their offspring. They have a common table, but not a common bed. They are in the flesh, but they do not live after the flesh. They pass their days on earth, but they are citizens of heaven. They obey the prescribed laws and at the same time surpass the laws with their lives. They are poor, yet make many rich. They are in lack of all things, yet abound in all. They are dishonored and yet in their very dishonor are glorified. They are evil spoken of, and yet are justified. They are reviled and bless. They are insulted and repay insult with honor. They do good, yet are punished as evildoers. Those who hate them are unable to assign any reason for their hatred. When I read that, I have a longing in my heart for the Christians in our day, for all of us at Emmanuel Anglican, to shine like this with beautiful distinction, to stick out for the right reasons, for our lives to radiate hope. And that's what this series is about. I I would love for our lives to radiate hope, even for people who disagree with our beliefs. And and today we're going to look at one key element of Christian distinction, and that is the Christian sexual ethic. Methetes summarized it this way when he said, they have a common table, but not a common bed. In other words, Christians share their food and possessions with our neighbors, but we do not share our bodies with them, nor do we ask them to share their bodies with us. The exception to this is if we, like those ancient Christians, enter into a marriage covenant between a man and a woman for life, 
where we bear children and raise them in the Lord, if, if we're able to do so, that is a very distinct way to live in our culture, is it not? Um, here's a question, though. Is that beautiful? Is that sexual ethic beautiful? Many fear in our day that the Christian sexual ethic is harmful, repressive, or maybe just backward. And whatever your perspective on this, here's my invitation to you. I want to invite you to listen to an ancient pastor whose name was Paul, write to a church in Asia Minor about this very thing. And I also want to invite you to open your mind and open your heart to any ways that the Holy Spirit, who's one of the persons of the Godhead, would encourage you specifically from this passage of Scripture. There might be some vision he gives you, or a call to repentance that he gives you, or conviction, or maybe just a fresh appreciation for the wisdom of this ethic. Um, we're at in First Corinthians, First Thessalonians four verses one through eight, and I want to highlight three words that help capture the Christian sexual ethic and also describe why it's beautiful. Three words that kind of capture the beauty of the Christian sexual ethic. And the first word that I want to highlight actually isn't in our text, but it's reflected in our text, and that word is Trinity. Trinity. Trinity is a shorthand way to reference the three persons of the Godhead. The Father, God the Father, God the Son, Jesus Christ, and God the Holy Spirit. The Trinity is not some abstract doctrine with no reference to our life. The Trinity is living and relevant to our sexuality. And we might ask, how is the Trinity relevant to our sexuality? Let's actually look in 1 Thessalonians because we're going to see Jesus, the Son of God, giving us encouragement and practical instruction through Paul, which is the way it works. Jesus gives instructions to people who take it into their life, and those people pass it on to others. That's how sort of Jesus told them to do it. Verse 1 of 1 Thessalonians 4. Additionally then, brothers and sisters, we ask and encourage you in the Lord Jesus that as you have received instruction from us on how you should live and please God, as you are doing, do this even more. Verse 2, for you know what commands we gave you through the Lord Jesus. Jesus is a teacher. He's a compelling teacher. He was a compelling teacher when he lived, and he's a compelling teacher through his disciples now. And he always will be a compelling and encouraging teacher. Now, what makes Jesus such a great teacher? Here's what it is. He knew two things very well. Number one, he knew his father. He knows his father extremely well. The second thing that he knows is the human condition. He knows the human condition very well. And his teaching connects the dots between those two realities in a way that sets people free. He still sets people free. That's what he says. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. The truth about us, the truth about the Father, the truth about the mediator, Jesus Christ. Let me give you an example of this. In Jesus's day, people knew pretty much that adultery was bad. This is where you cheat on your spouse. And they knew, okay, that's bad. They knew that from the Ten Commandments. Here's what Jesus said. He said, you've heard that it said, don't commit adultery, but I'm, here's what I'm going to tell you something. And that is that if you look, with, oh, look at a woman with lustful intent in your heart, you've already committed a type of adultery in your heart against her. Now, what's Jesus doing? He's getting to where the Father wants to get with every single person, which is to the heart, which is what's going on that no one else can see. God can see it. God wants to change. the. It's not just the rules and the outward form and pretending to be a good person. It's the heart. Are you changed on the inside? Are you holy on the inside? Now, Jesus was such an excellent teacher because he could get to that with just a few words every single time. He, wants, he, want, he knew that we were supposed to be changed from the inside out so that we wouldn't be people controlled by lust. Now, everyone who has become relatively free of lust, listening to Jesus, following Jesus, will tell you this. Listen, Jesus is a good teacher and you can trust what he says. And man, the truth set me free. And, and Jesus is teaching, they'll tell you that Jesus is teaching makes it possible to live up to the high calling of the father, which Paul references in verse seven of our text. Just skip down, look down at verse seven of first Thessalonians four, where Paul says, for God has not called us. And this is reference to the father. God is shorthand reference to the Father. For God the Father has not called us to impurity, 
but to live in holiness. God the Father is not like all of the other so-called gods, whether in Greek myths or in modern life. Every other so-called God takes more than they give. And that's what impurity is at its core. It's taking more than you're giving. It's selfishness that corrupts every relationship. That's what makes a relationship impure is that it's corrupted by something that's wrong, that's taking, that's in conflict with the way of love. God the Father gives more than he takes. His relationships are pure, from his end at least. They're untainted by any kind of selfishness. What is God the Father known for? He's known for his holiness. That's his signature trait. That's what his call on all of us is, holiness. Holiness allows God the Father to be generous, overflowing with goodness, overflowing with love that doesn't come with these strange strings attached. So God the Father, he doesn't call us to impurity but to holiness. He wants us to become like him. All right, Jesus, the teacher, God the Father, who's giving the call to holiness. Let's look at the third member of the Trinity. Who is the, this is the only way that we could ever live up to this call. It's the only way we could ever listen to Jesus' teaching and, and follow through with it. And that is verse eight, the Holy Spirit. Consequently, anyone who rejects this does not reject man, but God who gives you his Holy Spirit. You're familiar with like white elephant exchanges, cheap gifts that you don't want anymore. Let me tell you something that the Holy Spirit is not a cheap gift. It's not like a white elephant exchange. It's not like a throwaway. The Holy Spirit is God's most, one of God's most precious gifts. He gave his son, who gave his life, gives his Holy Spirit, his own first gift. The Holy Spirit is going to fill our minds, our bodies, our imaginations, our relationships with the power of Jesus Christ, with the love and the purity of Jesus Christ. That union we don't deserve, but it's such a gift. And our sexual choices are either cooperating with the presence of the Holy Spirit or ignoring the voice, presence, and guidance of the Holy Spirit. So can you see Paul pointing to the Trinity? The Father who's calling us to share in his holiness, the son Jesus, who is giving us encouraging teachings for how to do that from the heart, and then the Holy Spirit who's empowering our wills and consciences and choices to live in holiness. Listen, friends, our connection with one another is meant to be God-infused, God-bathed out of reverence for God, out of holy fear of God, out of respect for one another. We're learning, like the Father, to give more than we take. We're learning holiness. We're unlearning selfishness. And here's one thing I want to say before we move on. Because of the Trinity, living with holy chastity is not a negative subtraction. It's a life of fullness and intimacy without any of the complications that come with lust and using one another. Holy chastity is not a passive, lonely, dreary existence. It's an active, vibrant life where we shine with the beauty of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as it makes its way known in our most intimate relationships. And that's what we're called to. The Trinity makes the Christian sexual ethic beautiful and distinct and shining. Here's the second word, and that's agency. Agency. We have Trinity and we have agency. Verse three and onward, for this is God's will, your sanctification, that you keep away from sexual immorality. That each of you knows how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not with lustful passions like the Gentiles who don't know God. Paul is calling every single person to agency over their own bodies and over their own desires. And this was revolutionary. And it actually, as people, as Christians practiced it over the course of four centuries, it turned the Roman Empire inside out. In the first century, in first century Rome, 17% of all the population was enslaved, 17%. Historian Kyle Harper demonstrates that these slaves had very little to no agency over their own bodies. 
and uh, what they call paterfamilias, the heads of household, very powerful men and paying customers could make demands upon these slaves for work or for sex or for some version of sexual contact. Now, Paul's word for sexual immorality here is pornea, pornea. And this is a bit of a catch-all term that refers to all of the different ways in the Roman Empire that people would gratify their sexual desires outside of the bonds of marriage, whether it was consensual or not. And it was everywhere. Listen, pornea was built into every sector of society. It was systemic. Restaurants, right? The theater, the workplaces, the houses of work, the temples, temple prostitution. Everywhere you went in urban centers around the Roman Empire, pornea was offered to you and it was expected that you would just go ahead, if you had the money and the power, if you were a person of honor, you would take advantage of the dishonorable and have your sexual desires met. And if you were unfree, as Kyle Harper called them, if you were unfree, it was taken for granted that you would be the one satisfying those desires. And that was your job. Pornea also included consensual encounters as well, like adultery, one-night stands, ongoing sexual connections outside of the bonds of marriage. And listen, we're in a different world, but our world is configured with pornea in it as well. Our city, our own city of Chicago, let's not hide from this, is filled with people whose bodies are treated as unfree. Our digital network is as well. Online pornography is made possible by sex trafficking and exploitation. Pornia also abounds in all of the consensual ways to fulfill our sexual appetites, whether it's a hookup or any sexual activity outside the bonds of marriage. And it's just taken for granted in our day like it was in first century Rome. If you want it, go for it. If you have the opportunity, go for it. What else are you going to do, right? What does God want? His will is for something higher than our pleasure or a satisfied appetite. He wants our sanctification. That is to say, he wants our lives to be beautifully distinct, to give more than they take. And his call, verse four, is to control our own body in holiness and honor, not with lustful passions of the people who don't even know who God is at all. Look, for God, honor looks like restraint of our sexual appetites. And in the Greco-Roman culture, as well as our own, people just think that's impossible or that's harmful. And Paul counters, look, God who created you makes it possible. Here's one way that this happens. Imagine that our sexual drive is like a river of water and, and it's used for good and it's intended for good. Pornea is where that river overflows over the embankments, over the dams, and it floods, creates a flood. It floods the communities all around it. What do floods do? Floods don't do good. Floods do a lot of damage everywhere it goes. And the damage of the flood damage lasts for a long time and is very costly to, to undo. And here's what happens when Jesus Christ gets a hold of our sexuality. He restores all of the healthy boundaries around that river, including all of the embankments and all the dams and everything else necessary for that river to be restored. And and then he directs that desire as he sees fit. Sometimes that desire is directed into marriage where children are born, and that is a very good thing. But also, sometimes he directs that desire into a, a full and rich life of celibacy, where instead of hurting people, whether we're married or celebrate, that same energy is put to use for prayer, for worship, for community, for service, for hospitality, for creativity, for friendship. And that's what restraint does, is that restraint makes us rivers, not floods. That is holy agency. Chastity doesn't dry up the river, it directs it. And that's what Gladys Hunt called holy sensuality, holy sensuality. Now, what might this look like in real life? Maybe we feel an attraction to someone or something that God hasn't given us. And that happens to every single person on this earth. Instead of, instead of going after it, we pause and, and we pray alongside Jesus, not my will, but yours be done. I, I, there's something that I want, Lord, but I want your will more. And then we reach out to a friend or a small group or we connect with Samson Society and we ask them to pray for us also. And, and we learn 
day by day to practice holiness. And it begins to set us free, not overnight, but day by day. And we find that over time, God is giving us more and more agency over our bodies and our desires and our appetites begin to serve us and serve God's purposes, not the other way around. And we walk with more dignity and we walk with more confidence and we walk with more strong connections with other people that aren't as tainted with lust and with taking. And we begin to live beautiful and distinct and honorable lives. That's agency. And all of us, through the Holy Spirit, are capable of it. Why is the Christian sexual ethic so beautiful? The first reason is because of the Trinity surrounding us, supporting us, calling us to something higher. The other purpose, the other thing that makes it beautiful is agency. And there's one piece that we can't leave out because It's so important, actually, that both religious people as well as irreligious people really care about this. But even more important, God cares about it. And that's justice. That's justice. Verse 6. Now look at verse 6. This means that one must not transgress against and take advantage of a brother or sister in this manner. Why? Why would this be? Because the Lord is an avenger of all these offenses. Also, as we also previously told and warned you. Now, the words of Paul for transgress against and take advantage of carry this connotation of defrauding someone and and thieving from them and taking something that belongs to them, ripping them off and like overstepping some sacred boundaries that are in place. Paul is, what's he doing? He's going to be highlighting some of the power dynamics that are at play in any unholy sexual encounter. And most of the time when we step outside of God's design and pursue sex or sexual gratification on our own terms, the power dynamics get extremely complicated. Often one person in the dynamic has more power than the other person. And they use, that person with more power uses it to cross boundaries and satisfy themselves. They steal from someone's innocence. They use and then discard their body. They defraud them of intimacy, which was intended only for one person for life. And and Paul's warning us, look, the Lord's paying attention to this, and he is an avenger in these matters. Sexual injustice, in the end, will not stand before the throne of Jesus. There will be severe consequences brought by the hand of the Lord Jesus himself. Remember what our Lord said in Matthew 18. He said, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to fall away, it would be better for them if a millstone were hung around their neck and they were drowned in the depths of the sea. In some seasons of church history, in some parts of the world, the church hasn't always paid attention to this teaching. It hasn't paid attention to 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 6. And it's put all of the pressure, maybe an inordinate amount of pressure on the young women to keep everyone in the community pure, to be the ones holding line, holding the boundaries. But it wasn't paying attention to the people with more power, especially the men who had influence in the community and stature in the community who were crossing sexual boundaries. And get the Lord Jesus will not stand for that and the church should not stand for that. He will assign accountability based on the power we had and how we used it in the lives of others, and if we're stepping over boundaries, and if we're taking what doesn't belong to us, the Lord Jesus will be an avenger in these matters. Are we using the position and trust we have to protect the weak rather than take advantage of them? Are we using the power that we have to get away with lewd comments, unwanted touching, crossing emotional boundaries, or worse? The Lord Jesus is paying attention, and there's grace, and we'll get to that, but we cannot miss this point justice now you ask what if it's consensual surely that's not unjust but let's consider that for a moment in the wake of the we me too movement people realized that a lot of what passed for consent was actually coercive behavior it was manipulative it was pressuring people into sexual activity they didn't really want now even when full consent is given from the other person that doesn't mean the Lord approves of what is happening. Sexual contact outside the covenant of marriage is always an act of stealing. You're taking something precious from that person and you're letting them steal something precious 
from you if you're allowing it. What do you say? What are you stealing? Listen, more than, especially in the moment, more than you're thinking about, more than you're aware of. You're not thinking about them. You're thinking about yourself and you're stealing. You're stealing something. Listen, lust takes the very thing that love gives. Things like intimacy and wholeheartedness and a sense of personhood and a sense of agency and dignity and joy. And even as you're stealing, you're withholding and withholding commitment and withholding fidelity and withholding finances and withholding your partnership and withholding your purity of heart, which wills one thing. Even if it's kept secret, it steals from the community. Listen, Emmanuelites, people of God, secret sexual sin impacts the whole church body. It might be under the surface, but it's still sick. It's still unwhole. We're living members of the body of Christ. So what we do as living members from Sunday to Sunday has great consequence for everyone else. And I just say, as I look at 1 Thessalonians 4, I just see that the Father has a much higher standard than consent. And that higher standard is called holiness. Verse 7, God hasn't called us to impurity, but to live in holiness. Holiness is like God's signature trait, friends. It's his distinct beauty, and he wants you and I to share in it, to partake in it, to reflect it. It's that radiant purity that never takes but always gives. Listen, God doesn't call perfect people to holiness. He calls imperfect people to holiness. He calls selfish and lustful and addicted people to holiness. Jesus Christ didn't just teach us about chastity. He died a costly death to exchange our impurity for his purity, our shame for his dignity, our lust for his self-giving love. He died a real death so that could happen. Let's not minimize that gift because it's there for us. His offer of forgiveness and cleansing is available to every single person who's fallen short of God's call. We've all fallen short. And the offer is there for us all. Listen, this past Friday night, I went to a DePaul uh, University volleyball match with one of my kids. And I noticed something very interesting. Collegiate level volleyball, it's super intense. Some of you have played it. Some of you have seen it. The volleyball comes at you fast and you've got to be extremely fast and skilled in returning the volleyball. And inevitably, it's like part of the game that the ball is going to come at one person who doesn't quite get the hit And instead of it going back over the net, it goes out of bounds or they're like diving on the ground and not quite reaching it. And there's this moment, I noticed that every time that happened, there was this moment where the player who missed the play basically is on the ground, chagrined, like ashamed. The other team is like, you know, they're like, and there was a moment of pain, but they didn't stay in that moment. Every single time, whether they won the point or lost the point, there was this team huddle. Have you seen this? The team huddle. It's like everyone gets, it's like everyone, including the person who missed it. The person who missed it is not allowed to stay on the ground. They're not allowed to leave and change out of their uniform and be like, I quit. I'm not on the team anymore. You're still on the team. So get up and huddle with the team. And let's grieve the loss and let's move on to the next point because there's more volleyball to be played. Listen, The Christian sexual ethic is much more difficult than collegiate level volleyball, amen? Okay? It's super difficult for the Thessalonians, for us. That's why this text is here. It's a fight. We don't always get it right. But when we fall short of God's beautiful vision, there's hope, friends, to wind it back, grieve the loss, stand up, come into the light, reconnect with the community, and begin to play again. Whenever we fail, we get out of, we step out of our isolation chain. We don't stay there. We don't stay on the ground. We don't leave the court. Our baptism still stands. Grace still stands. We stand up. We reconnect with Jesus and his people. Why? We're on the team, right? Sins can be confessed. Mercy can be extended. Restitution can be made. The flood can become a river once again, and that's true for you. And I want to speak especially to people who feel hopeless right now. We're stuck in shame. You're not meant to stay there. This is hope for you. This is a call for you. God has plans for you. If you're living and breathing right now, there is a hope and a future for your life. There's hope for holiness from the inside out. There's hope for doing away with all sexual injustice. There's hope for, become, for taking on a life of self-giving. There's always hope 
my brothers and sisters. And I just have to say this, that the ambient sexual ethic that's offered to us, in my mind, doesn't have a whole lot of hope. It, it uh, applies to a certain subsection of the population for a certain amount of time, but it doesn't usually end well. And also there's no bright and glorious future. Listen, the Christian sexual ethic, it might be difficult, but because of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit's love and grace and support for us, it is possible. Also, it's beautiful day by day. It's possible and it's beautiful. And friends, I want all of us to follow Jesus and shine together, not perfectly, but by grace. And I want to invite you now to approach the throne of grace with me. Would you pray with me now? The Lord be with you. And I just invite you now to invite the presence of the Lord into whatever, wherever this sermon leaves you. There's a burden the Lord has given you. You can begin to offer that up to him now. You could also thank the members of the Trinity for their love for you. Each member, the Father, is called to holiness, the Son, his teaching, his death and resurrection for you. The Holy Spirit, precious gift of the Holy Spirit filling you. Just grace washing over you through this presence of the Father, Son, and Spirit. I wonder if some have a request that God gives them agency, restores agency to them. Self-control, honor, not my will but yours be done. I wonder if someone in the quietness of your own heart has a prayer for justice in your own life, just starting with you. Maybe there's someone that you've taken advantage of you need to make it right with them. Maybe you can even begin to pray on behalf of our community that any injustice or defrauding would be brought to light and that it would be made right. And let us all now turn to the Lord for grace and mercy, for help in time of need. Aaron's going to lead us in the confession of sin. But I just want to pray, Lord, Holy Spirit, help us confess our sin. We often don't even know what we need to confess. Sometimes we do. But help us, Lord, leave behind both blindness to our sin, but also guilt and shame and secrecy. Help us step into the light. Lord, help us step into our high calling and let us be a distinct and beautiful community that gives more than we take and that flows like a mighty river, Lord, to your glory and to your honor. In Jesus' name, amen.